Everyone's still good. I still got everyone with me. I can't see the chat going on. Oh, I see some people waving. We're going to stay in Japan and we're going to go back in time. The paper cranes, they're a stand in for a real bird. And that bird is magnificent. We're talking about the red crowned crane. There's a few cranes in Japan, but this, this is the one that you think of when you think of the Japanese crane with its red top and its white body and the black edging on its wings and on its face. It stands up to five feet tall with a wingspan of seven to eight feet. And when it does its mating dance, it calls a duet in rhythm with its mate. See, crows might live a thousand years, but they're famous for something else. Long before children were folding those paper cranes as wishes. They were given to brides and grooms for their wedding. They were embroidered on the kimonos. They were painted on the wedding plates. Cranes were famous for being faithful mates and glorious lovers. And this is the crane wife. There's a lot of versions of this story, and I'm going to tell you one. Snow has a sound. You probably know it. There's the crunch when there's a crust over the snow of ice. There's a squeak when the snow is packed tight under your boot. But snow has a sound of its own, a deepening, a softening of snow on snow. Once there was a poor man. He lived in the mountains of Japan. And he went out into the snow with the crunch and with the squeak, and with the hush. He was gathering wood when he heard another sound. It was the cry of a crane. And he followed that sound until he came to the crane itself. He was injured by an arrow from a hunter. It was wounded and dangerous. It had strong wings, but he took off his jacket and he wrapped the bird up in it and he put it onto his bundle of wood and brought it back to his place. And there he removed the arrow and he nursed the bird back to health. Well, when it was time, he opened the door and the crane stepped out, looked back once and flew off. But that very night, there was Hoto, hoto. A tapping at his door. He opened it a little bit, and there was a beautiful young woman, shivering in her thin clothes. Please, she said, I need a place to stay. Ooh. He was very poor and also a, a young man, a young woman, alone in the house. I have a bag of rice. She said, some say it was a magic bag of rice and it never got any less, but you don't need that kind of magic. Not when there's two people looking at each other. He thought, why well, have a door if I don't open it? So he let her in. You may stay, he said. He cooked the rice and, and they sat kind of awkwardly. They shared the meal, but... Day by day, they grew into a rhythm as housemates do. She cleaned and mended and helped him keep house. But one night they found themselves cooking side by side, talking as if they always had. And that meal stretched out until moonrise. Look, she said, and she pointed to the strong moonlight coming in through the filtered window. He opened up the door to get a better look and he heard the cry of a sentry crane checking on the others and tasted the snow. It was going to be a long winter. He looked back at the table and, and there sitting at his table, their table, yes, yes, their table. He said to her, will you stay? Will you be my wife? Well, they didn't have much. 
but they must have had a wedding feast. Oh, with fish and kelp, with citron and mushrooms, red miso soup, and plenty of rice. They must have decorated a colorful table and shared drinks and promises. And the new bride, she asked her husband, for winter was going to be long, would you make for me a weaving room and a Oh, well now, a wife who weaves, that was way better than going out in the snow. Yes, he did it at once, and he put up the paper sliding doors and made the small room smaller. And then she said, when I go in to weave, you must promise me, do not come in, do not look, do not peep. He promised. Pata, pata, tom, tom. Pata, pata, tom, tom. Three days she was at the loom. He left food, but she didn't come out. She didn't eat. She didn't drink. He didn't even know if she slept. When she finally came out, she looked so thin and pale and worn, but, oh, the cloth. He didn't know that much about fabric, but anyone could see this was something special. He took it to the market the next day and it brought a great price. They celebrated the new year in style. But winter, it kept going on that year. And I told you it wasn't magic because that bag of rice definitely ran out. All of the rice ran out. And she said to her husband, I shall weave one more time. Remember, do not come in. Don't look. Don't peek. He promised. Pata pata tom tom. Pata pata tom tom. Three days. Four days. And she came out. Oh. But if it's possible, the cloth was even more beautiful. It was so thin. It was so light. It was so white. It seemed to shine with a, a light of its own. Well, he fed his wife and he put her to bed and he watched her sleep. And then he went to sleep dreaming, I'm sorry to say, of money. This cloth is too fine for these people here, said the merchant who bought it from him the next day. You should take it and sell it in the city to nobles. I will give you five times this for the next order if you will let me sell it there for you. Ooh, he was so proud of his wife selling to nobles. Tell me, said the merchant, what cloth is this? What thread does she use? What? Uh, he had no idea. He hadn't bought any materials and, and neither had she. But more intriguing than the question was the promise of riches, of a life of comfort, the likes of which he had never known. What say you, said the merchant. Will you take my order? Well, he could have said, I'll ask my wife. He could have said no. He said yes. He took payment with the promise of five times that upon the next delivery of cloth. But when his wife found out, she, she said, we don't need the money. And so he didn't ask again. But she saw how he looked at that paper door. She saw how he tossed and turned in his sleep. And finally she said, I will weave for you one more time, but you must promise me it is the last and you must promise me again. You will not come in. You will not look, you will not peek. He promised. And I know you're all in your own houses, but if you would do it with me, it's two patas quickly together and a slower tom, tom. So pata, pata, tom, 
tom, patter, patter, tom, tom, patter, patter, tom, tom. One more time, patter, patter, tom, tom. Three days, four days, five days. The sound was pounding in his head. The room was very small. He knew she had not eaten, she had not slept, and he worried that she was doing too much, that she would make herself sick. But also he wondered, what is her thread? How does she weave? Well, it was a small house. The paper door was very close. He went right up to it. He put his fingers on it and he slid it and he peeked. Oh, but there was no woman in the room. Red cap, white wings, black edging. It was a crane plucking its own feathers and feeding them into the loom for the thread. Oh, he said, oh, she said. And it was the voice of his wife rising up on a crane's wings. I am the crane you rescued, said the crane wife. And I came here to repay the favor. But now that you have seen my true form, I cannot stay. Some say it was because he didn't understand what love requires. Some say it was just because he looked when he promised he wouldn't. And some say it was because she was a crane after all and never a human. But when he begged her to stay, she pushed past him. The cloth is on the loom, she said, and it was white and light and thin and glorious with a single thread of red running through it. What could he do but open the door? She stepped out and flew. Well, she was weak from hunger and thirst. She was wounded from plucking out her feathers. But the cranes came from all over they flew in and claimed her. The crane.